I'm Olga Pulevayan, a project manager at GSB. GSB is a sponsor of this event. Together with our partners, Global Digital and CTO Outsource, we prepared the content for this seminar. Thank you, Sita, uh, to help us to organize and to have all of you here. Um, our company, GSB, specialized in solving um, business problems with uh, software solutions. That's who we are, who we to be. And today, uh, in our seminar, we will have uh, three speakers. It will be one hour continuous sessions. We don't plan to have any bre breaks or intermissions. So if you need to leave the room, welcome to do that. And uh, questions and answers section will be at the end of this seminar because we kind of want to have this continuous session. I hope you will enjoy and it will be helpful for you. And let's start. And we want to start with our first topic and I want to invite on this stage our first presenter, Mike McTaggart. Mike, as you'll see, is passionate about two things being a dad and technology. He started his career as an engineer, uh, was part of the a team of consultants dedicated to digital transformation. His personal focus is on elevating and aligning IT as a partner to the business. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So we are here today to talk about digital transformation. Um, just to let you know, I'm going to try to pack about 35, 40 minutes of content into about 30. So you're going to see I get worked up. I'm passionate about this anyway. Uh, but I want you to know a couple of things about me to start with. There's all the other bio stuff. You can read that. See my LinkedIn later. Most importantly, I think, for today is, you know, I'm a lifelong geek. I've always been this way. This is me maybe nine years old at Christmas, over the moon to get a dot matrix printer. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and if I recall, this thing is a beast, and it was definitely better at producing decibels of noise than dots per inch. All right? And some of you remember some of those. All right? Also, I'm a dad, as you heard. I'm a dad of just turned six-year-old triplet girls. I share that, not for the, you know, but uh, thank you though. Um, I want you to know that I'm not easily rattled. Like, you know, so you know, as we talk today, interrupt me, you know, tell me that your neighbor stole your apple juice. Like, what, you know, the more of that, the more at home I will feel up here. Okay, um, So I want this to be interactive as possible. So getting into the meat, what are we here to talk about? Digital transformation. What is it? You know, we're, we want to start with concepts to execution. What is the concept? Well, if you ask someone to define it, well, you're going to get as many definitions as you ask people, right? You know, everyone's talking about it. Everyone has dedicated blogs on the topic. You know, but if you ask someone in storage, like a NetApp or an EMC or such, they're going to talk about, well, it's all about big data, right? You know, you've got all this data you've got to collect and store on our products. You ask someone that sells switches and routers, they're going to say it's all about everything being connected. You know, so it completely depends on who you ask, which really doesn't help us today. So for the next 30 minutes, I want to try to create a unifying definition. So where do we start? Well, the one thing everyone agrees with is that digital transformation is a mega trend. What is a mega trend? It's essentially a change that is so broad that it leaves no one and no thing untouched. It doesn't matter if it's an individual or a small business, like maybe yours or mine, or Fortune 100, entire nations and economies. And that change is impactful to the degree of being permanent. And how impactful? Well, people smarter than me have done the analysis and done these projections. This is the head of Cisco back in 2015. He said it's such a big change that if companies don't adapt, 40% will die in the next 10 years. And he said this in 2015, so we're going on three years ago. Right? The clock's ticking. So we know that it's a big deal and it's going to affect us. How? Well, going a little further with creating a common ground definition so we can dis discuss the how, I'm going to propose this as a unifying definition for at least the next 30 minutes. 
the next speaker might disagree with me. That's cool. But for today, for right now, I propose that digital transformation is a process through which you differentiate your company using digital technologies to gain competitive advantage. Right? I see some people nodding, so we agree so far. Let's unpack it a little bit and see if we all still agree. I read a marketing book like once. It was called Differentiate or Die. It was a pretty good book. And it, it basically said that the whole point of differentiation is to gain competitive advantage. We'll see more nodding, so I think we're still on the same page. We can agree that that part of the definition is sound. So let's expand a little further. Some of you that have worked with me, some of you clients in the room or such, you've heard me say that digitization by itself is not transformative. And in that, I'm talking about you know, companies that deploy tools. You know, we install new software, we install new tools, and we think that's the part you know, that leads to transformation. But it doesn't. We're digitized. We're going paperless. We're going electronic. That's great. But without addressing more than the products and services and the, and the process inside your company, without addressing your people and your culture, you won't achieve transformation. So I propose that we define for today your organization or your business as the sum of, of product, services, and people, or culture. All right, more nods, good, good. So last, and this may be the most contentious, I propose that we define digital as software. Okay, and there's probably some hardware people in the room, but I'm a software guy, so I'm naturally biased. And I feel that the hardware is becoming increasingly ubiquitous. The iron and the servers themselves are getting virtualized. They're software defined, networks are software defined. The sensors and the hardware that we depend upon are also becoming commoditized. It's easier and cheaper to get those and procure those, and so everyone has the same hardware. What differentiates you then is the software that drives the hardware. How do you use the hardware? And that's often that's software driven. So I'm a software guy, but I like to find digital as software. So that really means the sum of our definition, at least for the next 25 minutes, is that digital transformation is to differentiate your company using software for competitive advantage. Nodding, everyone's still there? All right, good. So, today, I'm gonna to cover three facets of digital transformation. There are a lot. There's a lot of different ways. We already talked about some of those. Depends on who you ask. So I'm just gonna to try to tackle three in 25 minutes. But as I do that, I would love if you guys could ask yourselves three questions. Okay. First of all, as you learn about one of these facets, something might strike you, and you might, you know, understand, you might start to realize, am I a disruptor or am I being disrupted? Okay. Part of what I want to achieve today is expand your peripheral vision, make it more likely that you're the disruptor than the disrupted. Likewise, you may see inside your own book of business, your own relationships, your own clients, that there are new opportunities there, potential customers potential partners, and maybe potential competitive threats. And then lastly, I'm hoping that something in the next 25 minutes, or hour really, gets you inspired, gets you passionate. If anything, just a little bit of my passion kind of wears off on you, because what we're talking about is transformation. Transformation is change. Change is hard, and it consumes a lot of energy. A great source of energy is that inspiration and passion. So try to make note of those things so we can tap into it later. All right, so three facets, three questions. We'll just jump in. Number one, your customers are evolving. And just a general disclaimer, I'm going to use embarrassing photos of my kids forever. <laughs> 20s, 30s, I don't care. I'm going to do it as long as they let me. Um, so once upon a time in marketing, this was the general communications model. It was one to many. Right, you think about broadcast media, print, uh, outdoor advertising, you've got one message as the advertiser and you are distributing it to everyone without real distinction of who gets it, when they get it, etc. It's a one-to-many broadcast. Now with the internet, we achieve something new, one-to-one -one communication. And those in marketing, particularly those in digital marketing, we kind of heralded this as, this was like nirvana, right? This was the holy grail of marketing and communications. And we thought that was fantastic. We could deliver an email message in a timely way with a personalized message, and it was all under our control, and even get analytics back on how they responded. But then something happened. Our customers, or our prospects, they went and changed. 
So there's a study done in Microsoft, by Microsoft in 2015 that said in the year 2000, our attention span was 12 seconds. But by the year 2013, that attention span had dropped to 8 seconds. Which, you know, that's bad enough. I mean, you're talking a 30% plus drop in attention span. You know, but worse than that, in that time, Sonny, sorry, you got passed by a goldfish. <laughs> Nine seconds attention span for the goldfish, but you know, eight seconds for us. And what was happening? Well, we were distracted by all these other things. Everyone was out taking you know, selfies. And Actually, that reminds me. Let me smile. Okay, we're good? Oh, yeah. All right, I'm going to tweet this later. And uh, you can follow me, tag yourself, that sort of thing. And, if, uh, and maybe my kids might even tweet it out. And if you don't believe me, this is what digital natives look like. This is when they were two years old. It's a, the technology is a natural extension of their behavior, extension of what they're used to. Each of them had their tablet and could use it proficiently at age two. Before they could even talk, they were using touchscreen computing. <coughs> so what do we do? Well, it's not really one-to-one -one anymore, nor is it really one-to-many, even though it looks similar to one-to-many. What it really is, is what I call one-to-network. One-to-network has its pros and cons, but if we look at the opportunity of what one-to-network represents, it's pretty profound. We have more channels by which we can engage and interact with our customer or employee or prospect than ever before. We have more context and insights, their likes and dislikes on them than ever before. So we can personalize and individualize that message in an unprecedented way. And to just top it all off, they actually want to share their experience working with us for free with all of their peers. So they want to do the distribution for us for free. Now, that sounds great, but how do you do it? Well, let's talk about one example. Who here likes McDonald's all day breakfast? <laughs> oh yeah, I've got the app installed on my phone and I'm a big fan of the Egg McMuffin. Uh, not the only one. In fact, there were a lot of people like myself that once upon a time were tweeting about how we couldn't get an Egg McMuffin after 10 a.m., right? McDonald's heard that and thought, okay, what if we consider all-day breakfast? Their analysts said that could produce a little bump in sales, 2.5% in an otherwise kind of flat or declining market. But if we look at just the U.S. alone, McDonald's is already the biggest consumer of eggs in the country. A little over 2 billion eggs per year bought by McDonald's in the U.S. So you start talking about rolling out all-day breakfast, there could be some ramifications there, like in your supply chain, right? So if you're going to do it, and you want to get a 2.5% lift, which for an $8.5 billion company is just under a quarter billion dollars, you got to win, right? So they went back to their base. Those same social media users that were asking for all-day breakfast and they engaged with a small army of people and a library of assets, photos, videos, highly shareable content, and sent 88,000 individual tweets saying, hey, you tweeted that you wanted this, we heard you, here it is, tell your friends. And the result was 5.7% lift in sales. It's over a half billion dollars if you were to stretch it out annually, all right? Far exceeding their expectations. That was just a quarterly bump. You see, change like this is really hard. This was innovative for them, but innovation is really hard. Which brings us to our second point. Why is innovation hard? A lot of questions I got when the triplets were first born was how the heck do we get them around? This monster, it was awesome. It was as big as a small car. It felt like a, a go-kart. In fact, it even had working steering, had four-wheel independent suspension, like I really wanted to convert this into like a cart or like a bobsled kind of thing after we were done. Uh, but it was a great example of innovation for a very niche problem. Yeah? What? I'm sorry. How did you get that in your car? Oh, no, cars weren't an option. We went minivans. We were a two minivan family now. So, yeah, you know, my, my man card was surrendered as I got the keys to the minivan. But uh, now I actually like it. So, innovation. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a challenge for a long time, right? Again, back to people smarter than me struggle with this idea of why do we struggle with you know, thinking about how to solve our problems? Well, part of it is using the same thinking that created those problems. In the corporate world, where I do most of my work, 
this is kind of the thing I see. And I'm an ex-engineer, so I've been on those teams and been in that environment where you have a great idea and your peers, your colleagues are like, okay, yeah, good luck. You know? I decided to do some research. And you know, research to me is part Google search, you know, part uh, peer review. Uh, but I came up with some images. I asked people, hey, how is, how is innovation described inside your company? And you see images like this. Each one of these steps being a gate. Your idea has to pass through that gate before it can proceed. So how many ideas make it all the way through? Because if they don't, they're dead and never to be heard of again. Yeah, and this is one of the simpler ones. I've seen plenty of flowcharts. I got sent this one. This one describes just how to fund an innovation. It doesn't even touch on the production, deployment, communication, and adoption. Not. You know? I was sent this one. And I tried to understand what was going on here. I still have no idea what you're supposed to do with this and how you're supposed to navigate this process. And the point is we make innovation really hard in business and it doesn't have to be that way. You know, so I wanna take us through a little exercise just real quickly of a, essentially a sample project, a fictional project, but one that you know, is fairly relevant. You know, oftentimes we get asked to move stuff from point A to point B. Doesn't matter if it's physical items and in inventory or if it's bits of data, right? Now, traditional approach is we create and architect a plan. I'm an engineer, so my clip art skills are only matched by my CAD skills. And that is our plan to move stuff from point A to point B. We start out, we have the team assembled, we hit our first milestone, and we deliver something to the customer. We have created the wheel, and we are proud of ourselves. Because technically speaking, that was quite an achievement. The customer, on the other hand, internal or external, doesn't think so. It hasn't really helped them, has it? Yeah, we say, okay, that's fine, bear with us. The next milestone's gonna, milestone's gonna blow you away because in the next milestone, we have figured out how to automate that process and make more wheels. Still doesn't help move them, those things from point A to point B, right? And so we keep going. Eventually, we you know, motorize the platform partly. You see, we've got something that is partially complete but wholly unusable. And here we are 75% of the way through the project and the customer hasn't really seen any benefit yet. And this is where a lot of projects die. I've been on those teams, all right? Funding gets pulled, someone decides, all right, I'm not seeing value, I gotta spend this money somewhere else, all right? If we make it through, if we survive that, we've got a great internal you know, or external customer, they're very patient, we can deliver on that vision we created maybe 12 or 18 months ago, right? But it doesn't have to be that way. If we borrow from that software world once again, we start applying what are called agile principles. Now, I'm not an agilist, but you know, it, it kind of goes like this. Let's experiment. Let's prototype something really fast. Let's just throw some wheels or casters onto a pallet and see if that helps. No, it doesn't really help. Okay, let's motorize it. Now let's iterate. Let's learn very quickly how we can please the customer, how we can improve our design. And ultimately, not only do we provide value more quickly to the customer and cheaply, we also may wind up with a superior product in the end. Okay. Now, some of you clapped when I said agile and such, and there are a thousand and one agile philosophers out there and systems and things you can adopt. I'm not here for that. I want to try to boil it down to four principles. Think big, act small, fail cheap. Because in business terms, failing fast really means failing cheap, right? And learn fast. And that's the most important one. I don't want to underemphasize that. Learning fast is the most important benefit and reason to embrace an agile mindset. Okay? And again, people smarter than me have figured this out. Here's the CIO for Intercontinental Hotels Group. He said it very simply. It's no longer the big beating the small. It's the fast beating the slow. 